Okay, hi. Uh, so thanks for coming this early uh, in the morning. Um, so I've done this work in collaboration with uh, Thomas Peters Act, Nicola Roussel, and Robin Balakrishnan. Uh, so I'm from DGP at the University of Toronto. Uh, Thomas is from University of Lille, and Nicola is from India. So I'm sure a lot of you have already seen the cool haptics presentations we've had over the past two days. So much cool work. And with so many advances in haptics in research on tactile devices, tactile perception, the question is why are tactile displays still so far and so inferior to visual displays? You know, why do we still have haptics being used as feedback patterns or as an assistant to visual interactions? Can't we make tactile displays closer in their capabilities to visual displays? And that's the question I'll ask today and possibly try to answer today. So, a single light source. It's the most basic form of a visual display. And when we combine multiple light sources, we get something like this, a light board. Now, a huge leap from that is the visual display that we use today. It has light sources so small that they feel continuous to us. And not only uh, do we just see it, uh, we interact with it constantly, back and forth. And how do we do that? Uh, well, the fundamental concept that underlies our interactions with such visual displays is direct manipulation. Right? So direct manipulation as a concept was defined by Schneiderman uh, in 1983. And its core principles are the permanent representation of the objects of interest, fast actions whose effects are continuously displayed, and direct manipulation of the objects of interest, which is why we call it direct manipulation. But uh, in practice, how do these principles translate? Like, what do we need for direct manipulation to actually work? Uh, for start, we obviously need a visual display and an input device. Now, uh, let's focus on the display. Um, we can think of it as a combination of the screen and the visual interface. You know, the screen is just the cluster of pixels. And the interface combines these pixels to enable objects. Now, the objects, for example, could be the pointer and the targets. And when we use the input device to interact with these objects, that results in actions. So actions are uh, the basic ones here would be pointing, target selection, target manipulation. Target manipulation is basically drag and drop. Uh, so these are the basics that make direct manipulation work. And we have done this really well for visual displays. It just works. But what about our other senses? Uh, what about the tactile sense, as I mentioned? Like, why can't we make something like direct manipulation work for the skin instead of the eyes? You know. So let's let's try and deconstruct this analogy. So what is the tactile equivalent for a single light source? A single tactile actuator, the kind that we use every day in our phones, right? What then is the equivalent for the light board? More tactile actuators, right? And there have been a lot of impressive explorations in the space. So how can different clusters, different patterns of tactile motors uh, be used to provide extremely rich tactile feedback? But what is the equivalent for today's visual displays? Now, if you think about it simply in terms of display capabilities, uh, in terms of feedback capabilities, the tactile display on the previous slide that I showed can provide fairly nuanced uh, tactile sensations uh, that even seem continuous to us. But what if we want to interact with a tactile display uh, like we do with a visual display? What if we want to do direct manipulation with a tactile display on the skin using a mouse? You know, Imagine a mouse pointer on your skin that you feel instead of seeing it. Can we do that? And if yes, how can we do that? And again, we go back to the visual analogy. OK, so if you wanted to do it, uh, we need a tactile display that has a screen and an interface. And again, uh, the tactile interface will have objects, the tactile pointer, and tactile targets. And when we interact with the display using a mouse or a trackpad, then we will have actions of tactile pointing, target selection, target manipulation. right? So we're done. right? Uh, we just add the word tactile to everything. And we're done. <laughs> of course not. Uh, so what do these mean? You know, We're stating these analogous terms. But what do they mean, and how will they achieve direct manipulation? So let's look at them one by one. OK, so a tactile screen is essentially an area on the skin. right? Now, every screen has a shape and a size. For a tactile screen, its shape and size are defined by the exact area on the skin within which a tactile device can convey 
sensations. So if I'm wearing a vest of tactile motors on my back, then a region on my back will be the tactile screen. If the motors are around my wrist, then the tactile screen will be the region around my wrist. Uh, so what is in that region of the tactile screen? What is it made of? Pixels, right? So tactile pixels. And what does that mean? That means that we can control tactile sensations on the screen at that pixel level. Uh, so what are we controlling in that pixel? In a visual pixel, we control color and brightness. A tactile pixel will have the stimulus pattern and the stimulus strength. So for example, for vibrating motors, uh, the stimulus pattern is the frequency of vibrations, and the strength is the amplitude of vibrations. Uh, so we have a tactile screen. Uh, now we have to do a tactile interface. What do we need for the interface? We need a pointer and we need tar targets. So what is a tactile pointer? As I mentioned, it is simply a point-like sensation that you feel on the skin and that you can control using the mouse. So let me illustrate this with a very simple example. We take a tactile screen that is a single line you know, that you see here. Uh, so it is simply a one-dimensional screen and not two-dimensional. Uh, and you can imagine it anywhere on your skin. So let's imagine it to be on the forearm. And uh, now we introduce a tactile pointer that moves over the pixels on, these scre on the screen. Right? So the pointer is moving on. So what is happening is that you just feel the pointer moving on the forearm as you control the mouse. OK, so we have a conceptual understanding of the pointer. Uh, let's not worry about how to implement this. I'll talk about that uh, later. Um, the next thing we need are tactile targets. And as you can see here, we illustrate the targets using the red shapes. Um, they're possibly small, and I think uh, people at the back might have problems seeing it. But there are two red shapes on the line. Um, so, and those are the targets. Uh, they, those represent the targets. So how would the user know that the pointer is over a target? Well, we simply designate the tactile sensation to be different when the pointer is moving over a target, right? So the pointer moves, and when it reaches the target, the sensation that we get is different, and that's the red color that we see. OK, so the user can know uh, if the pointer is over a target. But how does the new user know where the target is in the first place? Right? With visual displays, the user is always aware of the overall state of the screen, uh, where the targets are, where everything is. We are just a simple glance at the screen. But the tactile sense is very different from the visual sense in that we cannot just glance at the tactile screen. We don't have a tactile glance, you know. Uh, so what we do is we require active exploration of the tactile screen area to identify tactile objects. And this is where the tactile pointer, again, helps us. Uh, in visual displays, the pointer is simply used to point and select targets that the user can already see. But here, the user explores the screen using the pointer as well, right? So now um, we have a tactile pointer on the skin, and we have tactile targets that can be distinguished from the empty regions or the void regions on the screen. And so we have these basic objects set up. And therefore, the actions of pointing, selection, and manipulation are simply a matter of using the mouse or the trackpad to move or click or drag and drop. But one thing that we need here is, is to give tactile feedback to the user on the success or failure of an action. And uh, that is something that we call success or failure response. OK, so I talked briefly about the concept of direct manipulation and how we can adapt it for uh, tactile displays. But can we actually make something that works? You know, So we built a tactile display that enables such direct manipulation. Um, and the specific implementation is our way to prove that this concept can actually work in reality. But there are many other ways that this can be implemented. Um, and because wrist wearables are so popular these days, we chose the tactile screen to be a circular one-dimensional screen around the wrist. And the screen resolution is set to 360 degrees, which implies that there are 360 tactile pixels. OK, so the hardware consists of a wristband that has uh, four vibration motors. We can see the vibration motors on the image on the right. And they're placed at the top, left, right, and bottom of the wrist, uh, which we designate as 0 degrees, 90 degrees, and so on. And the input is via a trackpad on the top of the wrist, as you can see. OK? OK, so how do we achieve the feeling of continuous pointer movement over 360 pixels using just four tactile motors? Uh, the tactile pointer not just needs to be like felt continuously on the wrist, but the movement sensation needs to work 
according to the speed of user control as well. And to implement this, uh, we use the concept of phantom sensations, which behaves uh, in that if you simulate two tactile motors that are in close proximity on the skin, so if you have two tactile motors that are here and here, and uh, we actuate them together, then we don't feel those two sensations separately. We feel a single sensation in the middle. And that's the uh, illusion that we use to generate uh, tactile pixels anywhere on the wrist. Right. So I'll illustrate how the amplitudes of the motors change when the pointer goes around the wrist. And here the four circles denote the four motors. A full black cir circle denotes maximum amplitude of a motor. And a white circle denotes zero amplitude. So you'll see how the amplitudes of the motors change as the pointer moves. Right? Okay, so after the pointer, we implement targets. And this is easy. As I said, uh, the tactile targets need to feel different from the wide regions. Uh, we do that using a different vibration frequency when the pointer is over a target. So we can see the targets in blue here. And the vibration frequency is denoted by the color of the vibration waves. Uh, now we can distinguish between a wide area. Um, so let me just show the illustration first. Okay, so yeah, you can see the color of the vibration waves changing, which is the frequency changing. Okay, so we can distinguish between a wide area and a target region, but how do you distinguish between two targets, right? They're, they're still the same. Uh, we can do this using even more frequencies or using different rhythmic patterns. But another thing that is unique for tactile screens on skin is that users can localize tactile sensations on the skin. And they can coarsely tell where they felt the sensation. So if targets have different locations, the users can distinguish between them based solely on the location uh, without the need for any additional modulation. And that is what we do for our implementation. Uh, the different targets are identified simply by their location. Um, of course, uh, another implementation can do different modulations, and that's... Uh, a subject for future work. Okay, so these are the frequencies we use, 75 hertz for void, 320 hertz for target, and for the action success response, we define three quick pulses at 320 hertz, and for action failure, one longer pulse at 320 hertz. Uh, so if the user, let's say, wants to select a target, but they click on the void region by mistake, the longer pulse will tell them that they missed the target. Okay, so the question is, now that we have this implementation, can the users actually use it for a practical application? And before we conducted this study, we obviously conducted feasibility studies and FITS law studies uh, to see if it actually works as we thought it would. Um, but I'm not going to go into the details of those. Uh, the final study that we did was about practical use. And so we did this uh, menu selection study where the task was to select one of the four menu items around the wrist. Uh, we also studied drag and drop of the menu items onto one another. Uh, plus we studied the same thing for eight menu items around the wrist. Um, now, I won't go into the details of the study design. Um, that's in the paper. But the results were really encouraging. Um, with less than five minutes of practice, the users achieved a 97% accuracy uh, for target selection with a three-second sele uh, selection time. And for eight targets, it was 92.5% accuracy with a 4.5-second selection time. So when we told the participant, okay, uh, select uh, Gary, they were able to do that uh, easily. Um, for drag and drop, though, the results were less encouraging, uh, with less accuracy and a higher selection time. So you can see it's 89% uh, accuracy and 87.5% accuracy and 9.9 .9 seconds selection time. But overall, uh, the message is that not only were the users able to perform tactile direct manipulation without any visual aid, uh, they achieved an accuracy of more than 90% on target selection with less than five minutes of practice. Now, and this is without, without any visual aid, so this is um, very interesting. Okay, and so we can conclusively say that direct manipulation can be enabled for our tactile sense and does not necessarily require any visual feedback. Um, so I wanted to leave you with this image. Uh, we talked about a one-dimensional display around the wrist, but imagine if we can do this for two-dimensional screens on our skin. Imagine a pointer on your back, uh, which you are controlling with your mouse, and you can feel different targets on the back. And this is what we are doing next, so it's going to be interesting. Thank you.